Good morning, everyone. Great to be back. And for those online, I trust my message will be meaningful and encouraging to you. Uh, I was at CFC South last week. Uh, they're, they're coming up to their fourth birthday in August. Can you believe that? But uh, Pastor Tim and Pastor Nikki, they're doing really well. Pastor Dave Bland is preaching there this morning. And uh, so uh, he's becoming part of the team there and, and being a, uh, a great support, both he and Judy, to Nick and Tim and the team, the fabulous team. I took them out for lunch. You know, Monica Hordaker, who's you know, one of our key young women and uh, part of the team and other new members that are there. So the church is doing really great, uh, wonderful. Uh, I was in New South Wales last week and then in Victoria this week for our CRC state conferences. So I've been flying around a little bit, sharing. Um, each year I go to our CRC conferences and share, and then next week will be our state conference here, So, uh, which is good. And then I'm, I'm actually down to visit all of our Christian Family Centre churches started with Tim and I'll be going to Darwin, Alice, Barossa Valley, Lefevre, the Hills, Tasmania. So I'm hoping to visit them all uh, by uh, at least um, halfway through the year. So it's good to be back. Stand Strong series. I watched Cass's message online. It was powerful. And uh, as she kicked off the series, if you weren't here last week, then don't miss the, the, the word week by week as it has a cumulative power and effect. Um, today I'm uh, sharing on joining the resistance. We have to understand how, how God works in relation to overcoming the devil and his uh, demonic powers. And I think one of the best illustrations, a bit like Joshua, when he crossed over the River Jordan in the Old Testament, when you read the book of Joshua, that land was theirs. God said, the land's yours. He, he said to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Israel, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, the land's yours. It's a gift. Um, you're a new creation. <laughs> All things are possible. Now, these are my promises. The land is yours. A bit like it, it, in our language today, in new creation, who we are now in Christ is has been promised, it's been uh, accomplished through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. However, there is a real enemy who will oppose God's purposes and who will oppose our lives. And so Joshua had to cross over the River Jordan and actually possess the land, but it was filled with illegal trespassers. They're a type of demons, type of evil spirits. And so uh, we've been given all the promises and uh, that are valid and right, and we say yes and amen, they're all yes in Christ, we say the amen. Uh, we know who we are in Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace, we depend on him. But there are real enemies that have to be evicted and dealt with, and so Joshua went there in the strength of God, and over a period of time, he evicted all those illegal trespassers, saying this is God's property. He promised it to our father Abraham hundreds of years ago, out you go. And in we come, and they actually possess the land. And so in um, the book of Ephesians, um, the New Testament, but I, I like the book of Joshua and the book of Ephesians. I kind of link them together a little bit. And um, the first three chapters of Ephesians has to do with the promises. Amazing statements of what God says about you now that you are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, get into Christ and see the wealth that is now yours through Jesus Christ as a gift. Wonderful, wonderful three chapters. Then he spends two and a half chapters and saying, now that you know who you are in Christ, now that you know your identity, now walk in it. This is how you walk the Christian life. He spends two and a half chapters saying, this is how you live the life. It's wonderful. And then all of a sudden, with a, with a thud almost like, boom, he talks about the devil and demons in the final 10 verses of, of chapter six. And it's interesting that he doesn't spend three chapters on how we overcome the enemy, how we enforce his defeat. He just spends 10 verses saying, if you know who you are in Christ, if you know your identity, if you understand grace, if you understand the promises, and if you're endeavoring to walk the Christian life with sincerity and honesty and humility, you're basically devil-proofing your life. 
And so this is how now you identify the enemy, chapter six, verse 10 to, to 20, and how you learn to enforce his defeat. He's defeated by Jesus through his cross and resurrection. We now enforce his defeat with the delegated authority he has given to us and we don't fear the enemy. In fact, the enemy fears us. If you understand who you are in Christ and you're walking and endeavoring with humility and, and honesty and trust in Jesus to walk the Christian life, then when the enemy sees you, when demons, they run, they're scared. They're scared of your prayer life. They're scared of your faith life. They're scared of how you're walking. And there's nothing in common that we have with them. However, if we don't understand our wealth and we don't know, we're not walking effectively and there's still some things that we haven't learned to overcome, there may be some things in common with our dark enemy that he may be able then to have access to exacerbate human weakness and uh, human sin and cause a lot of mischief. And so when Paul jumps into Ephesians 6 verse 10, it's like a reality check. And he says, guys, you've got to join the resistance. Join Joshua's army. It's time to evict some enemies. It's time to, to, to claim the victory that is legally yours, now experientially yours, you can actually outwork it. So Ephesians um, verses, verse 12 is a fantastic verse. I've got an amalgam of the New King James Version and the New Living Translation. He says, put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. Notice that wiles, he's a sneaky devil. He's a sneaky, he, he's a schemer, and he's a liar, he's a deceiver, he's a slanderer, all the names of the devil, you ought to do a study on it. Deceiver, slanderer, accuser, thief, murderer. And uh, there's nothing redemptive about him. He fell from God as one of the angelic beings, and he hates God, and he hates anyone who who loves Jesus and he hates us because we're made in God's image. And, and we chose, our, our freedom is that we choose to love God and we choose to obey Christ. Demons are so corrupted, they don't even have the capacity to change their hearts, they can't repent. So they just hate God. And it says uh, through the envy of the devil, Adam and Eve fell, he envied us. The devil's not a happy chappy. You don't find him smiling in the Bible. There's no, there's no joy there. I think Sir Thomas More said that proud spirit cannot, cannot stand to be mocked. So when you're doing your warfare, be happy and, and laugh at the devil's lying and stealing and cheating and, and say you have victory. He's not happy. He knows where he's going. And his whole ambition is to take as many people with him to hell and damnation. There's a battle for our soul, a battle for human souls. And so he, he is strategic in wanting to keep people in darkness. So he says here, put on the whole armour of God. And not next week, but we're having a break with Mother's Day. But after that we're doing, we're looking at the armoury, the armour, the different pieces of armoury that God has provided. And uh, the, the, the teaching pastors will be sharing on that. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the sneaky wiles of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood, enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And so Paul, as I said, he has a reality check. And the first thing I wanna say is this, that, the, that there is this reality of the spiritual conflict and warfare we are in. And sometimes it's a rude shock, it's a rude awakening that takes place. Then, oh, okay, um, you know, Paul's purpose in, when he talks about the devil and demons, it's not to scare the living daylights out of us, it's to actually, not just to satisfy our curiosity either, but to inform us that our struggle is not with human beings, but with cosmic intelligences. We are at war with disembodied spiritual beings, people without bodies. <laughs> they have all the hallmarks of personality, but they've got no body. And they desperately want to do their nefarious work through using human bodies. So our real enemies are not human, but demonic. And he warns us of the devil's hostility towards everything we, we stand for as followers of Jesus. So I said, he hates God, Satan hates God. He despises Jesus and, and he um, envies us. Jealous, envy, all the dark side because we have chosen to love God. He hasn't even got the capacity to choose to repent. He doesn't want to repent. He's just full of darkness. There's nothing redemptive in him. 
He's going to, he's, he knows where it's going. He says, well, I'm, the only happiness I'll have is I can take as many of these people that, that love God with me. So Paul warns us and, and uh, informs us and he wants to teach us how to overcome these dark and devious forces of evil uh, through our faith in Jesus. And he helps us to see the victory that Jesus won over evil and the devil through the death of Jesus on the cross on our behalf and his resurrection from the grave and he's alive today and he sends the Holy Spirit to come and live within us so that we can learn to overcome and live as he wants us to live. In Colossians, Paul makes an interesting statement. I, I love this. I'll just deviate a bit from Ephesians to Colossians. Uh, I want to read how he expresses this victory over sin and death and Satan uh, when he writes to these Colossian Christians who are in central Turkey. Because you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. Wow, he cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. He did it for us. All our sins, past, present, future, be nailed to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And Paul, no question, is, is alluding here to how Roman generals would, would uh, uh, do their triumphal marches. So when you read in the history books that you know, General Pompey and, and General Caesar, Julius Caesar, had their, their, their great uh, festivals, it may have been two or three years after they won their victories. In fact, Julius Caesar had defeated the whole of France, most of Belgium, Holland, um, half of Germany, went into England twice and started the conquest there. He conquered Egypt, he conquered the uh, uh, whole pile of places. So, so a few years later, came the triumphal marches. And these are, Caesar spent hundreds of millions of dollars to feed Rome and to give them presents. And these parties would last for weeks. And it was a way by which the generals and their armies could march through Rome. And what they did is they had the enemies that they had conquered in chains behind them. And these poor guys, as they're looking at Rome, and there's a million people out on the streets. Everyone, it, it's, it's a public display, are just cheering the great leaders and they're booing and hissing and cussing the, the enemy, saying this is, so these enemies were being defeated psychologically after they were defeated physically. And so what, what he's saying here is, that's what Jesus has done to the devil and demons. That's the kind of image you need to have in your mind. They're defeated through the cross and resurrection, and he made a public spectacle of them. And we're to ridicule them. We're not to magnify their power, we're to magnify the power of Jesus, and we mock him. And we say, you're a defeated foe. You're an illegal trespasser. You can't do what you're doing in my life or my family's life, I'm gonna stand against you and your nefarious works. So this is the reality of spiritual warfare and the conflict we're in. Secondly, there are extreme views about the devil and demons that people have. There's some funny views. Um, and, and so the, the first one is, well, we don't give him any attention. Okay, oh, he doesn't exist, no attention. Or the other extreme is we give him too much attention. You know, one is we're oblivious to the enemy. The other one is we're obsessive about demons. They're two extreme positions. In fact, the devil would love people to say, to not even believe in him and not to acknowledge him because he can do his work without any interference, prayer, faith, awareness. And so uh, thankfully in this place, we try and be balanced. You know, we don't, we don't say he's not real, he is real. But we also do not get obsessed with the enemy and blame all the wrongs that take place and even our own mistakes, oh well the devil made me do it. No, the devil's a slave to his own nature. We make our decisions, he can inflame and he can disrupt and uh, we need to understand this. I I've been reading uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters. Who's actually read The Screwtape Letters? Can I see your hands raised? Are there any others here like me? I read it when I was probably in my late teens, early 20s, and I must admit, it was a bit too deep for me. I'm thinking, oh, okay, Wormwood. You know, this chief demon. So Screwtape, you know, and he's training a junior demon called Wormwood. 
So it's a bit of a parody. And uh, so it's about 20, 28, 30 letters. They're not long, they're about two pages each. And it's very, very clever and uh, on how the enemy works, the strategies of the enemy. I've been listening to, uh, I think it's a Wheaton College professor, he does 10 minutes on each of the letters, and, uh, and I think, oh man, that's so good, I didn't understand that, oh, is that what he means? And then I get John Cleese, you know, the famous John Cleese, he reads the screw tape letters, and I'm taking down notes, it's just a great exercise, I'm enjoying that study. I've learned so much from the great C.S. Lewis, the, the man who wrote Mere Christianity, he wrote this in the 1940s, and, um, and so uh, I would encourage you, it's a good exercise to do. And uh, I'll, I'll bring him up a little bit in a few moments as well. Hey look, there's two extreme views about demons that people have. Uh, you might be in one of those views. Oh well, you know, devil, I don't even think he exists. Or the devil, people say, oh the devil's in me, it's just my human nature. Well he's very real. He would like you not to give him any attention. Then he might be able to be doing stuff without your awareness. And when you become aware, then you go, okay, this is not just natural, this is, this is supernatural and I need to deal with it. Or don't get obsessive and think, oh, you know, it's, all, it's all the devil, it's all I'm thinking about. No, we should be thinking about Jesus and his victory. Paul gives us two descriptive metaphors in this passage we just read. One's a wrestling metaphor, the other is a soldier. So you know what Greek Roman wrestling's like? Well, it's pretty ugly actually, it's not very nice. Um, because the, the men are always in the nude, so that's, that's not pretty. Um, and so they're in the Olympic, and they oil their bodies up, right? They're oiled from top to bottom, you know? And so it's very hard to get a grip on them. So, so Greek Roman wrestling is like, it, it, they're slippery. How do, you, how do you beat them? So you try and get them in a, in, a, in, a, in a bear hug and they do what children do. You know what kids do when they don't want to be hugged? They just go, Hew. they just drop and it's hard. But the, the imagery is one of, it's pretty slimy, it's pretty creepy. It's, it's almost like cheek to cheek, you know, sort of like, it, it's creepy there. Wrestling is, is, is not a distance, it's not like you've got a gun and you're gonna fire against the enemy. It's like up close and personal. It's like he's on you and you've gotta somehow throw him off you. And the other metaphor is of a Roman soldier because Paul was chained to soldiers for, quite a few years he was in prison and uh, whether he was chained or whether well, he was on some occasions, other occasions they were just looking after him and uh, he was house arrest or prison in Caesarea, prison in Rome. So he knew Roman soldiers, he knew every piece of their armory when they took off their, so he kind of, as he's thinking and reflecting, he says, man, I can see, yeah, 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 that belt, that belt that holds everything up. Oh, men love belts, if, if our belts are loose, we're in trouble. And then the belt, he says, that's truth. And we'll talk about, in fact, I'll be doing the belt. Then breastplate of righteousness. So you hang the breastplate on. It has to do with the right standing with God, right living, truth, righteousness. And then he talks about having your shoes ready, being ready as an armed soldier to be on the march. He talks about the helmet being secured, helmet of salvation. The shoes are about preaching the gospel of peace, sharing the gospel of peace. The shield of faith. And then he has the sword of the spirit and the power of prayer as our offensive weapons. We're gonna talk about each of those pieces of armory to help you understand how we outwork the victory of Christ. But these illustrations of a wrestling match and a well-armed soldier illustrate the reality and the intensity of our engagement with these powers of evil. Folks, it's, it's close hand-to-hand -hand combat with our enemy. The Christian life is a battleground, it's not a playground. There can be no temporary truces or ceasefires until the end of history. And this will happen when Jesus returns and establishes the peace of heaven here on this troubled earth and by golly is now earth troubled. If you're following what's happening, it's really troubling. We have a worst crisis among the superpowers than we ever had in the Cold War. I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was a 10 year old little boy and I know how my parents freaked out when John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev came that close to a nuclear exchange that could have wiped out hundreds of millions of people. Today, today, yesterday, the day before, the Russian government warned, don't go too far, we will use nuclear weapons. They said that. 
to actually set it. Where are you going to use them? Don't push us too far. We will use them. I thought, that's unbelievable that uh, a nuclear exchange could occur. And uh, what manner of evil is this that we could see 100 million people die within half an hour through the release of those weapons? The world's a mess. COVID's caused a huge amount of difficulty. Now we've got war and the Australian government is actually saying to us, get ready for war? I don't know if you've been following, saying we've got to get ready for war. They actually believe through the intelligence services that there's going to be a conflict with China. They've actually believed that. Every nation in the Pacific, from Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, Australia, and now they want a base in the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, where Australians died and Americans died. It ain't gonna happen. It's just, it's just awful to think of, what? Just within 1,500 k's, there'll be a major base next to Australia, cutting off the US with that. It's dangerous, it's a dangerous world we live in. There are, there are monster men out there and I think devils are having a heyday to say, oh, we want power, we want control, we want economic power, we want military power, we want more land. And uh, it's an awful, it's, it's, it's an awful situation. And it's waking people up, it's shaking people up enormously. One of the things that, that are in the screw tape letters, which is really interesting, is uh, screw tape says to Wormwood, says, don't worry about the war. So they're not worried about the Second World War. I mean, millions of people are dying. He's saying, what we've got to worry about is that people start thinking about God in war. They don't, they're not worried about people dying, they're worried about people start thinking about death, eternal life, what's life all about? They're being insecure, they're thinking through, oh, what's a bit like what COVID has done? A bit like 9-11 when that happened, the churches were filled. The churches around the world were filled in the war on terror. Where there's war, People's security uh, is upset. So I'm, I'm believing that there's going to be significant, massive awakening in, in Europe through this terrible war. And screw tape, selling Wormwood, saying, oh, this is dangerous times. It's not because they're worried about people dying in war. They're worried about people waking up and saying, there must be more to life than just eating and drinking and marrying and, and then having a job and then dying. You know, what's life all about? Are we going to be wiped out? And people start thinking about God and about eternity, and he's trying to hinder, he's trying to hinder what he calls his patience from thinking that way, interesting. And I think our world is, is, is getting ready for, and is, is actually happening. Uh, some of the statistics we're having, getting from the Ukraine is the Ukraine has had significant revival over the past uh, 12 to 13 years, ever since 2014, a significant growth in, in the churches, and now, of course, with what's happening there. And so uh, the peace of heaven's going to come only when Jesus returns here in this troubled world of ours. The whole of the interim period between Jesus' first and second coming is characterised by conflict. You don't believe me? Read history. That's my major at university. Conflict, 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 conflict between people, in families, between nations, between races, between societies. In the midst of all the good and the wonder of our advancements that have taken place. And it's been fantastic. We've advanced as a society in so many ways, and yet we haven't been able to change human nature. Envy, jealousy, hatred, lust, violence, whether it's between people in domestic violence, whether it's within racial groups, whether it's in national groups, because the only one who can change the human heart is Jesus Christ and the peace of heaven to come into people's lives to help transform the equation. Folks, we're not automatically immune from the devil's influence. That's another myth. People think, oh, well, you know, that Jesus has won the victory and uh, he has risen, he sent the spirit, therefore I'm automatically immune. We're not automatically immune. Just take Jesus' disciples, <laughs> the disciples. I mean, Peter, he's close to Jesus. He is really full on, he's a full on believer. Yet certain times it's like he gets demonized. It's like there's a demon sitting on his shoulder whispering lies to him that appeal to his unsanctified sinful nature and he does some stupid things, crazy things. Jesus prays for him, he says, in Gethsemane, he says, Peter, Peter, Satan wants to 
sift you. He wants to hurt you and the other 12. God, I've prayed that God will help keep you. So if it wasn't for Jesus' prayers, in the middle of Gethsemane, as Jesus is preparing to die on the cross to take away the sin of the world, Peter tries to, to stop him. At one time, even before then, Jesus said, looked at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about. Peter shoots his mouth off about something to do with, no, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. And Jesus says, basically says, Peter, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You're listening to devils sitting on your shoulder. He goes, get behind me. He wasn't actually saying, Peter, you're a devil. He says, you're listening to the wrong voices, son. Because he had such gaping wounds in his life, fear, insecurity, anger. And then in Gethsemane, as he's, Jesus is sweating blood and he's told Peter, he said, well, Peter comes out from the darkness with a sword and he wants to kill a cop. Ah, you know, man of peace, love. I love people. I'll chop your head off though. He could have been hanging on the cross next to Jesus. What is that? How can a man who says he loves Jesus and loves people and, and, and all of a sudden act like he's demonized. That's not the normal Peter. He, the anger in him, it's like the enemy saying, now go for it. Out of control anger. He tries to kill a policeman. And Jesus, oh, how, does, how does Jesus feel? Put yourself in Jesus' position. He's, this, he's been praying all night. He's sweating blood and tears. And I, I don't think Jesus is going, oh good, here's an opportunity for a new healing campaign yeah. in the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't think he was wanting to bring... I think, Peter's, I think Jesus is going, oh no, no, I'm glad I prayed for you. And, I'm, and what's he do? He, he grabs the ear and sticks it back in the guy's head and stops the bleeding to save Peter's neck. James and John, beautiful, beautiful Johnny. He's the apostle of love. You know what they did? These prideful, arrogant boys, they get their mum I said, Mum, little gossip, little bit of, you know, they were so envious, they were so jealous, they wanted position and power. They got their mum to go to Jesus, say, Jesus, you know, Jimmy and Johnny, they're good boys. I know you love them. They're part of the three. You know, when you get to heaven, can you put Johnny on one side and, and Jimmy on the other side? Forget about Peter and the others. Favour my boys. Who, who set mum up to do that? It was James and John. What kind of demonic lie based on pride motivated them? Because it caused such division among the 12. It could have split that, that ministry team of 12 through envy, jealousy, pride. And Jesus basically gave one of his most powerful statements about what it means to be a servant and to be a sacrificial servant. He says, you, you boys don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're even asking. He's like the Lord is saying, you really don't get it. But what is the force behind two good boys who've got an issue with pride and envy to motivate their mum to go and do such a terrible thing that could cause division? I smell a demon there, whispering in their ears, building on their pride, human weakness. So we must be vigilant to identify demonic interference, folks. Not a matter of becoming obsessive, but let's not also be ignoring them. We've got to be vigilant to identify demonic interference and to resist it militantly in Jesus' name and with the delegated authority he has given to us. Identify and then resist. The peace which our loving heavenly Father has made through Christ's cross is to be experienced only in the midst of a relentless struggle against evil. And you're in it. You're in it. You think I'll ignore the enemy, he'll ignore me. It doesn't work that way. So Satan opposes you individually. He opposes people individually and he opposes people, church communities like ours. So how does he do it? Now I've just listed a few things down here just to open up. I could speak an hour on each one of these, Ooh, but we're not gonna do it. Firstly, he spiritually blinds people. His mission is to capture the souls of men and women. So they will go to hell with him far away from God. In Dante's Inferno, it's really interesting when you look at the, the painting of Dante's Inferno, it's pretty scary. The devil 
is right at the bottom and you think, you know what he's in? He's actually in ice, frozen. I thought that was really interesting, not, not in hellfire. Dante's saying it is the place we're furthest away from God where there's no revelation, there's no heat, there's no light, you're just frozen in ice. He knows he's going there and he wants to take everybody on planet Earth with him. The mission of demons is to blind people's minds from hearing the gospel message of, of, of life and salvation that comes through your witness and our corporate witness as a church. And he will oppose a person and he will oppose a church that is endeavoring to proclaim this message. And this is what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, let's and it's an insightful passage. It says, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, the worldly systems, not the physical earth, the antichrist systems of our world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of God, who is the exact likeness of God. He spiritually blinds people. Secondly, he tries to steal the sown word from people's lives. I mean, Jesus, again, profoundly says this in his great parable of the sower. He says, now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. Automatically immune, you can receive the word and that sneaky devil will somehow come and take that word out of your heart. He opposes our mission endeavors. Wherever there's mission, evangelism, church planting, he will oppose it. Paul is so wanting to go back to Northern Greece because he had a lot of trouble in his second missionary journey. You can read it in Acts, whether it's in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, no, he's just really, He's going through it, it's hard. He has two or three weeks or a few days in each place and he runs for his life down to Athens. You've got to go to Athens where the philosophers are. They won't kill me there, they want to discuss things. And uh, then he goes to Corinth. But he's really wanting to go back to Thessalonica and um, up to those towns of Northern Greece because he wants to reach more lost people. He wants to plant more churches. This is what he says, dear brothers, 1 Thessalonians 2, and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you, and I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us, hindered us. He will hinder where there's mission, where there's evangelism. He will distract. He will endeavor to oppose. He hinders us from doing God's will. This is the prayer that Jesus prayed for Peter, that he wouldn't crash and burn. I've already referred to it. It says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, the 12. But I've pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented, notice, you need to repent. He doesn't say you need to have a demon cast out of you. He says you need to repent for some mindsets and attitudes that are empowering the negative in you because that's what the devil is exploiting. And he says, okay, so you need to repent, son. I'm praying that you would repent. That your faith would not fail so that when you have repented and turned to me again, repentance is, 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 is actually change of mindset which leads to a change of behaviour so one can trust Christ. Turn to me again, then strengthen your brothers. Paul makes it clear that the devil will try to deceive vulnerable people. Over the years, I can't believe how many vulnerable people get seduced by deceiving demons about some Bible teaching or some worship experience or, or something about fellowship. You know, sort of extreme notions and views of biblical interpretation, extreme forms of worship, extreme ways of how fellowship should be. And this is what he says. He goes, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some people, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. So Paul says, don't give the devil a foothold with all these dangerous emotions. And he lists them, lying, stealing, sexual lust, bad speech, foul language, and uh, a whole pile of stuff he lists. He says, these are the, these are the sins of the flesh 
But if you give in to them, you're going to get empowerment and the devil's going to gain a foothold. Hey, finally, let's stand together as I, as I close this. I want to challenge you on this and pray for you. What's our response to our infernal enemy? The only response, Jesus' little brother James, he tells it straight on how to overcome this tricky enemy. Look at the scripture. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride is the mother of all sins. So you've got to be honest with yourself. Is the enemy exacerbating some natural problem that I have? You've got to, you've got to be honest. Say, you know what? Is there some demonic interference in my life and in my family? And let's pray together. Let's close our eyes. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us your word. It's so clear. Help us to become aware, Lord, of how the enemy works. But Lord, help us not to get obsessed with him, but to get obsessed with Jesus and the victory of the cross and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as we outwork Jesus' word. But help us not to live in denial, but to face up to the reality and the intensity of our engagement with these powers of evil. Help us, Lord, to face up to it. Help us to lean into you. Help us to become resistant, to stand firm, never cross these lines. Submit to you, face up to our human weakness and foibles and frailties, to be honest with our brothers and sisters and our leaders humble ourselves before you and to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Thank you for that, Lord. And thank you that James says to us how we need to be so careful and make sure that we really wash our hands, come close to you. Oh, Lord Jesus, we want to come close to you. We know that you'll come close to us. We want to wash our lives, Lord, really wash our lives, purify our hearts as we humble ourselves and are honest before you and then we can resist the enemy and he will flee. Bless your people here on this side, online and those who will be watching this later. I pray bless them, help them, help them to outwork the victory of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.